And coming up tonight on The Wrap, Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign continues to stumble as Chipotle's stock continues to soar. New Kansas welfare rules ban the purchase of tattoos, lingerie, and psychic services. There goes Heather's retirement destination. <laughs> and would you want to live to be 1,000? Rick Unger shares his secret. We'll discuss all of that, plus yay or nay and potluck. This is The Daily Wrap, live from New York City. And joining me tonight after a good dish of Chipotle, as usual, <laughs> is Sirius XM host, Forbes.com columnist, and the guy who keeps inviting me to play Candy Crush on Facebook. Oh, oh, he is my co-host. You too? Yeah, I hate that. Hunger loves that. Loves by the that way, game. I'm the 2,000-year-old man. <laughs> oh, really? One of my favorite recordings, by the way. Fascinating. We'll discuss that a little bit later. <laughs> and she's a power attorney from Philadelphia. She's America's pundit. Heather Hansen is here to Lady in Red. Right. And finally, she's the editor of JaneUnchained.com. She bought books and everything. Jane Velez Mitchell is here. Let's up. get right to the daily download. Yeah, I'll try both your chai and your Carmelo, and maybe a glass of water too. Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Can do that. And maybe Jen with some lemon in it, like you've got. That would be great. <laughs> I can do that. Good. Well, I'm going to go over here. And there she is, everyday American Hillary Clinton, just stopping by a coffee shop in Iowa to speak to some everyday Iowans. But the visit wasn't random at all, and neither were the people that are at the coffee shop who talked to her. But we'll get to that in a bit. Yes, we've all been talking about Hillary Clinton a lot lately, but the reason is she gives us media types so much to talk about. Today alone, news reports talked about how Mrs. Clinton's Chipotle visit leaked by the campaign of Mrs. Clinton. CNN reporting. CNN uh, saying Clinton misrepresents family history. Huffington Post says Hillary Clinton praises Elizabeth Warren. And it goes on and on. But let's start with Tuesday's first campaign stop in Iowa. Of course, these stops are planned, but you don't always hear about patrons being bought in to talk to the candidate. But that's exactly what the Clinton camp did on Wednesday. The Daily Mail reporting that these men were handpicked by the campaign staff and even driven by Hillary's people to the coffee shop. Both individuals happen to be heavily involved, by the way, with the Democratic Party in Iowa. Rick, a little embarrassing to say the least that this news got out. You know, it's everything gets out. And that's actually my problem. If you take any one of these incidents, they're not that big of a deal. So she exaggerated a little bit. She shouldn't. But, you know, take all these things and they're not that big. But what's bothering me is I look at her campaign staff and I go, what's wrong with you people? Don't you know the time we are living in? If you say something that's an exaggeration, there are going to be 15 reporters who have the facts that are gonna jump on you. If you lock kids or sort of lock kids in their, in their classroom, because that was over-exaggerated, but it's going to mean a story. All of these little things that equal stories, you have to avoid these things, folks. There's nothing you can say or do in the year 2015 that will not be recorded. And if Hillary hasn't learned that by now, well, I don't know what to say. It's a great point, Heather, because with Google now, you could look up anything and, and anybody can be tracked. It's, it's not 1992 anymore when her husband ran or even 2008, to Rick's point, and it is perfect. You can't get away with anything and the scripted moments just aren't going to fly for 19 months. Well, and that's the problem. She's really uncomfortable. Like, even in that shot we just showed where she's ordering the water, you can tell that she feels like she's being watched and she doesn't like it. Well, she she was doesn't being have, watched. but she doesn't have that comfort level yeah. that her husband had, that Barack Obama had when he was running. She doesn't have that ability to be the every woman that she's trying to appear to be. And if she can't do it, then she needs to try to appear to be something else because I, that lack of authenticity is a problem. I think Dang. you're all ganging up on Hillary. I mean, she, according to a lot of people, can't do anything anything right. If she has a driver, oh my gosh, she doesn't drive herself like all the other candidates drive themselves. What a nonsensical objection. If she goes into Chipotle, she's a fake populist. Oh, if she talks to a bunch of um, informed young Democrats in Iowa, uh, what is she supposed to do? Go out and hang out in the corner with a bunch of stoners who barely know who no, the president she, of the no, United no, no, no. States is? But she is of supposed course. to be able to go into a diner and talk to regular people. She is. And I agree with you. A lot of this is nonsense. A lot of this is unnecessary. But 
Her campaign is putting her in this position. That's the the the, the crime to me, not what she is it's or isn't doing. It's avoidable nonsense. It's, it's avoidable nonsense. nonsense. I'd be very concerned. I am very concerned about that. I don't know what these people are thinking. They're not running this correctly. Let me say this. I think this is all going to boomerang because I think a lot of women relate to what's being done right now to Hillary Clinton, and they're going to empathize and relate to how she's being attacked, and it's going to boomerang on those people who are attacked her relentlessly because they're gonna see obviously it comes from a bias it's not attacking her issues you know oh, they attack her for the Clinton Foundation I did some research today uh, 80 some percent of all money raised by the Clinton Foundation goes directly to programs does anybody ever mention that no well I, I, I mean to, to Jane's point Carl Rove wrote an op-ed in today's Wall Street Journal talking about how you can't just attack Hillary. You've got to come up with a You've better argument. Own, You've got to have your, your own, own policies, policies and something to go forward. And I think that that's true. Attacking her is not going to win the game. Let's bring in Some another opinion on this one. Famed economist and opinion maker, Peter Morrissey from Washington, D.C., joins us. Peter, what are your takeaways from the start of the campaign so far? Well, I think Hillary won the first round, and now she's uh, getting beaten around a little bit in the second round. Her introduction, her video was very, very solid. Uh, it hit the high points without her saying very much. Uh, you know, race, gender, uh, fairness, jobs, equality. Those are the things that Barack Obama represented and used to cobble together 51% of the votes. And now Mrs. Clinton wants to hold on to that majority. The Republican response was largely negative. Uh, it wasn't about what they would do for these people, but rather it was about, you know, tarring Mrs. Clinton. The reality is, no matter how much you rope it, though, Mrs. Clinton, because women want a woman president, that unless they show them that they have something better to offer, she just never goes down very much in the polls. I thought that Karl Rove's column today was a bit stretched, uh, and I, it, I, I, don't, I, I thought he was trying very, very hard to make a statistical case. Peter, what was that column, just for the folks at home that, that didn't read it? Uh, basically, he, he went through a lot of statistics to try to show that she was vulnerable. It kind of reminded me of that night on Fox, election night, when he was trying to say that the computer was wrong and that one way or another Romney could still win. Uh, but the Republicans need to come forward with a positive agenda, and they haven't done that yet. Instead, they're focused on what f people might say and think in South Carolina, which is not a good microcosm of the electorate, and, uh, and, and they're just not winning because of that. Peter Morrissey, joining us from Washington. Thanks so much for your input. We appreciate it. Coming up next, Kansas is making headlines with its new rules for welfare participants. We will explain. This is The Daily Wrap, only on Newsmax TV. Who's the Republican nominee likely to be? You know, I don't really care. I think they're all losers. Oh, great. Uh, they're all losers here to react. One of those um, one of those people who's running for president, we've got Florida Senator Marco Rubio. Good are morning, you, Senator. Are you feeling hurt? No, not really. I mean, the worst thing we can do is talk about it. That's what he wants, you know, and uh, there's a there's supposed there used to be a line of civility in American politics. And it, it's particularly problematic on the left. They never argue with you about your ideas. They're, their almost instant reaction is to attack you personally and call you a name. Welcome back to The Daily Wrap. I'm Joe Concha, along with Rick Unger, Heather Hansen, Jane Velez Mitchell. What was Harry Reid thinking exactly when he said that? I know he's all tough with those sunglasses on. <laughs> kind of looks like Joe Pesci in a, in, in a roundabout short way. <laughs> but best I've ever seen him look. Probably, it's right? cool. Go yeah. get your shine Gosh. box. No, it's but cool. he was the former majority leader in the Senate and therefore should conduct himself accordingly, one would think. Does Marco Rubio have a point? Does the left just resort to name calling just Rick Unger. We, you know what? Yes, and just as much as the right resorts to name calling, would you like me or name calling to sit here and do a litany of some of the things that Republicans in the Senate have particularly called President Obama? He is right. This is uncalled for, uncivil, should never happen, and yet to sit there and, and pretend this is what the left does, oh, please. I mean, even my conservative friends, who are many, would look at him and go, what, are you kidding me? You, you say in the Senate things have been said about well, President Obama, but yeah, at the leadership level, you're saying that they're have just ever, as bad as, as some of the things that Reid has said? Have you ever heard oh, yeah. John Boehner talk about Barack Obama? 
every time I hear it, it boggles personal, my mind. Yeah, personal attacks, though? Oh, yeah. or, or a difference like, with policy? Give, give me an no, example. Personal. Like what? Okay. I have an On example. TV? Go ahead. Go ahead. I have there. an example. Okay, uh, Rand Paul accused, just unleashed an ad that accuses Hillary Clinton of arrogance, corruption, and cover. And the RNC chair accused her right. of a trail of secrecy and scandal. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, those are, okay, he called them a loser, so secrecy and scandal. <laughs> but it's different. Uh, I mean, that is much different because policies. you have somebody, right. That's, Both that's, sides do it. Let's not pretend otherwise. I'm willing to cop to my side doing it. But, but, but you shouldn't pretend that people on the right don't do the same. I don't remember same anybody way. calling somebody a loser. Really? Not the though. same way. I mean, I don't think you can give an example of someone doing it in the same way. I think Harry Reid, I don't think there's a lot of other people on the left who do it. I think Harry Reid is on his way out, and he just is not afraid to let loose. And I think it's going to be very dangerous because we still have a period of time where we have to deal with this guy and he has no problem with saying that he lied about Mitt Romney and that everyone else is a bunch of losers. Are you a fan of Harry Reid and his legacy, no, Jane? I'm no, I'm not. I Why think that? that he, they knocked the sense out of him when he had that accident. He should not <laughs> speak until his eye heals, which could be a couple of years. But uh, I do Do you feel think the eye is affecting the brain? <laughs> I'm saying, I think <laughs> interesting. He, he seems to have gotten a little wobbly ever since that uh, that exercise and, accident. Well, it's not since then because he, he's done something even worse than this. His whole thing about Mitt Romney, where That's I don't right. know that he was lying or not, even if he made a mistake, to sit down last week right. and say, I'm not going to apologize. What, you never heard of politics? Yeah. That was despicable. That Guess was what? Wrong. We're going to talk about that a little bit later in the show, my potluck. Oh. 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 Armed and ready for bear. getting worse and worse, and it's dangerous because he has some time left. I would think that he would care about his legacy to a certain extent, right? I, I don't get he's a loser. He I, sounds I just, bitter. Bitter, right, yeah. right. But why? About what? Right, you were exactly. in the Senate for 27 right. years. You live in Vegas, or at least near it. That's the dream. <laughs> I got power of government. I got free alcohol. I got access to, you know, the I palm. can gamble on the House as much as I want. <laughs> yes. I'm a senator. You're right. What's his problem? I think he's got nothing left to lose. You know, he's talking yeah. now yeah, about I trying agree. to force a vote on the on Loretta Lynch tomorrow, or later well, on this, the next week. He's right about that, because this is outrageous. Uh, we'll talk okay. about that another day, I'm All sure. Right. Well, I don't know if you've heard or not, but a new Kansas law is now banning those on welfare from using cash assistance from the state for, among other things, concerts, tattoos, lingerie, otherwise known as lingerie, <laughs> nail parlors, uh, what else? Vacations, alcohol, cigarettes. Also, it limits the amount of cash that one can withdraw a day to $25, which gets you about one drink with tip in Manhattan these days. <laughs> All right, Jane. I mean, we've seen other states try to regulate these things, right? Uh, some say this is an attack on the poor. Your thoughts? I agree with it 100%. And that's why I feel this whole liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican thing, there's no way you can just side with one side on everything. And I really feel welfare needs to be reformed and that it's ridiculous, for example, to be able to buy junk food with food stamps. We've got to revamp everything. Uh, obesity is sadly uh, correlated to poverty. So why give people money to buy fast food and junk food? Why not insist if you're going to get money from the government, you better eat a healthy, for example, plant-based diet. I totally agree with that. And I think we got to cut back on all of this, but I also think we got to end welfare for the rich, like the subsidies to big ag, like the ridiculous experiments that are completely useful, useless that the National Institutes of Health funds because they're make work projects for rich scientists. Uh, we've, we have so much money we can save in this country. The idea that we've cut to the bone is nonsense. I, I, I cannot understand why people would object to this. You know, it was drafted by the Kansas Child and Family Welfare, Welfare Organization. They're putting it forward to help children because you'd rather have the parents spending money on good food rather than on alcohol, lottery, whatever it may be. I don't understand. You know, the Washington Post, the LA Times, Jon Stewart all think that this is just a horrible thing and I really don't get it. I'm going to ask you to tolerate me just for a moment because I didn't want everybody to think I had a brain hemorrhage when I said that John Boehner mm -hmm. called President Obama a loser, <laughs> appearing on State of the Union, talking on behalf of uh, Mitt Romney. He said, that would be John Boehner, the American people do not want to vote for a loser.
They don't want to vote for someone who hasn't been successful. I think Mitt Romney has a chance to show the American people that they too could succeed. He called him a loser. He, no, no, no. He's oh, saying, yeah, he did. He's In saying fact, that Mitt Romney is very different. This is a conservative magazine call, saying Jezebel. that he called him a, le a loser. I didn't no, get that no, out of that quote. No, well, he, he, it's different. They're, sure they're a I bunch can. of losers versus no, the no, American people no, no, don't no. want to vote for a loser. He's You're just avoiding the welfare question. No, I'm, I'm going to get to that next. <laughs> I actually do agree with you guys in, to, to a large extent. No, those people should not be spending their money on that stuff. I think what's upsetting people is that you've got people who are constantly saying, we don't want the government telling us what to do, and then turn around saying, but it's okay to tell poor people what they have to do. With government it's, money. I know, it's government money. It's a little more complex and complicated than it's being painted. I would do it a different way. I would not tell people what they have to do, but I would develop a system so that you know what they are buying, you know, based on how their cards are used, and you can call them in and challenge them if they're wasting the money. But who has the time or the resources to do I that? Know. That's, it's a, that a problem. A it's a very problem. tricky issue. Yeah. I'm not going to say you're wrong. Gaming and, but there has yeah. to be there accountability, are. and if it can't be that way, it's got to be this way. It's Especially in Kansas, one. where there's not a heck of a lot to do, and you <laughs> see why they're going to go towards you alcohol. You should have some sympathy for them. Well, absolutely. Never been to Kansas. So, so who am I to judge? <laughs> anyway, coming up next, would you want to live to be 1,000 years old? We'll talk about that next on The Daily Wrap. And welcome back to The Daily Wrap. Today, over at Newsmax.com, there's a great article on living to 1,000 years old. We're not talking days or months, but actual years. Researcher Aubrey de Grey was asked about his theories on CNBC last November. This whole idea that a person could live to be 1,000 years old, how realistic is that in your view? Well, first of all, it's vital to understand that any longevity benefits that may arise from this kind of work are a side effect of health benefits. We are not going to be pe keeping people alive in what we currently think of as a typical state of health of someone old for a long time. What's going to happen instead is we're going to be extending the period of life that we now consider useful. <clears throat> That beard looks like it's about a thousand years old. Anyway, the gray, that really is his name, told dot com dot au, quote, if we ask the question, has the person been born who will be able to escape the ill health of old age indefinitely, then I would say the chances of that are very high, probably about 80%. DeGray isn't the only one trying to extend life. Silicon Valley investing heavily as well. According to the Australian, Google CEO Larry Page has started the California Life Company and will build a $1.5 billion, with a B, dollar life extension research center in San Francisco. <laughs> Meanwhile, Oracle CEO Larry Ellison has funded the Ellison Medical Foundation and California venture capitalist Paul F. Glenn has poured hundreds of millions of dollars into Ivy League College's anti-aging research. How much revenue will the anti-aging business bring in? Tons. The Australian reports last year the global anti-aging market generated more than $280 billion. Yes, by 2018 it will hit $400 billion. Call your stockbroker. Wow, gang, any interest at all? <laughs> Heather Hansel, I'm going to start with you being the youngest on the panel. Uh, Living to 1,000. No. no. <laughs> no. What's that? De <laughs> no, we, we, we talked about this before. I, you are older by two months. That's right. All right, so we're That's not right. total transparency. Right. That's right. You know, so what about me? About I can be age, younger. So. What's that? Okay, no, mind. you're not younger, no, you're like younger. younger. Yeah, younger, younger, that's right. All right, no, answer the question. I, I, not only do I, am I not interested, I think that it's a dangerous thought in many ways. You know, you talk about the rich and powerful, obviously, are the ones investing in this. They're the ones that are going to be able to afford it. They're then going to have more money and more power, and it's really going to cause some problems. And then other things like marriage. Do you want to be married for a thousand years? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I do. I do. Good yes, answer. Yes, Good yes. answer. And for the young people getting jobs, if the older people are working longer, people come out of school, they're not going to be able to get jobs. There's a lot of issues that come along with this idea of immortality. It's a great point you made about uh, marriage for, for a thousand years. Careful. Right? No, no, no. I'm just saying. it. The whole thing is till death do you part. Right. right. Right? And there was a whole Curb Your Enthusiasm about this where Larry David is <laughs> excited because he's because he wants to be single in the afterlife. <laughs> and his wife says, no, no, no. It's for all eternity. He goes, no, no. It's death to us part. The whole thing.
Uh, Jane, what about resources? If people are sticking around, we might kind of run out of stuff like water and space. Well, it's no accident that billionaires are the ones wanting to live to a thousand because that's how long it's going to take them to spend those billions and billions of dollars that mm. they have. But yeah, we're going to hit nine billion people by 2050. We should be putting all our resources in reducing the world population. More people have been born since death 19... Death panels? You're, you're advocating death panels on national no, I'm, television. No, I'm advocating don't get Ooh. pregnant in the first place. Oh. All right, well done. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I okay. think there are so many uh, children who are orphans, who need good homes, and I'd say adopt. Adopt. It should be really something that's very important, and also family planning. We really need to encourage people not to have kids if they can't afford to pay for them, if they can't afford to educate them. I mean, this is a very serious How do you get problem. To that from the thousand-year lifespan. I'm just well, curious. because you're talking about putting all these resources ah, into helping people live longer. Extending life and more people living longer. When our, and we're so run out of room. so the, that that earth. list of people who are spending hundreds of millions on staying alive, it's like a bad Indiana Jones movie. Really? Really? Yeah, I thought can they were all good. And, and can we put the picture up of the, that guy again? Is it? Can oh, the gray. Oh, yeah. yeah. right. There he is. I mean, look at that face, man. I would believe anything that guy said to me. And if he tells me that I'm going to live a thousand years, I mean, look at him. Is that not a face you, you just know who have that is? to believe? No, I know. It's scary. That, no, that's Hugh Jackman. That's I Hugh say Jack it's Hugh Jackman Jack with a long <laughs> beard. He looks oh, that's what I said. Yeah. We've all been duped. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Scary. Can we keep that's, him up for the rest of the show? I, I uh, think, we'll just no, talk I think, over him. I think I don't believe him when he says that it's going to be no problem living to a thousand, is my well, point. Well, the other issue that comes along is what kind of a life is it? You know, people who suffer from depression and people who have strokes or other well, things that you can't. You don't have to do it. It's, it would be if you want to do well, it, this treatment. Okay, well, how do you off yourself then? Come work, well, that's the thing. Right? No, you don't suicide. have to do it. He's not saying you'll naturally live to a thousand. What he's talking about, if you, if you look at it, he, they're developing a process where, you know, when you hit 60, it would take you back to 30. When you right. hit 90, they could take you back to 30. Is, a thousand so, is the 60. new 40. Yeah, a thousand right. is the new 40. <laughs> exactly. so, so you wouldn't have to undergo it. Okay. Uh, my answer to the thousand question is at 640, I'm out. That's it. That's it. Yes. <laughs> I would have done it all if I buy that. Anyway, coming up next, it's potluck time. That's where we go around the table and share our favorite stories today. It's fun stuff. This is The Daily Wrap, only on Newsmax TV. Welcome back to the Daily Wrap. It's potluck time, part of the show, as we were saying earlier, where we go around the table, Rick, and we share our favorite stories of the day. If you're wearing red, you get to go first. Look at that. Wow. Uh, Good job. Not me. Must me. be you. It's all me. You little beat. Yep. <laughs> you know, I love the little beat. Um, <laughs> So my story today is about Sofia Vergara, who is in a big battle with her ex-boyfriend, Nick Loeb, I think is his name. Who is Sofia Vergara? <laughs> Sofia Vergara <laughs> is a gorgeous <laughs> actress who is on Modern Family, amongst other things, and she is on a lot of commercials. She has a line for Kmart. She's done extremely well. Okay, she, let me be clear. I know who she is. I'm saying for the make audience sure. at home, there we go. We're they, That's her. her. She's, uh, she's not attractive. All right, nah, keep going. She all. dated a guy for a couple years, and they were together, and they planned to have children together, and as part of that plan, she didn't want to carry the children so they took her egg and his sperm and created some embryos and um, planned to have them put implanted into a surrogate as when they decided to get married when they broke up these embryos still existed now the paperwork that they signed at the fertility clinic allowed for if one of them were to die the embryos would be destroyed it did not allow for if they were to break up huge problem huge problem fertility clinic if you're if you're a fertility clinic you've got to make sure you cover that yeah, problem right. <laughs> so it's think. not covered but it gets into a really interesting issue of the law and just policy because his position is these are my children these are embryos I, I'm Catholic and I believe that life begins at conception and so therefore they are mine and you cannot destroy them and so he, he's objecting, objecting to them being destroyed. Sophia's position is, I don't want these children. I don't want to be a parent. I don't want my children running around. Now, the law is pretty clear because this has become a, a more common thing, and it will be more common in the future. The law says, if you agree, fine, whatever you agree to. If you don't agree, the documentation rules the day. No documentation, no documentation. here. The final step is, if you don't agree and one parent does not want to be a parent, Chances are the law is going to go with that parent because they're not going to force parenthood on someone who doesn't want to be a parent. Mm -hmm. Which you can understand, but at the same time, you look at someone like this man who wants these children, right. they are his children, 
and you can understand why he would well, have a major objection yeah, to Yeah, because while they're not forcing the one parent to be a parent, and they're denying the other one the right to be a parent. That's, that's really a tricky, messy legal question. It goes back to my point is that there are so many children who need homes in the world who have nowhere. They're orphans. Why not adopt? Why get into this um, position where, you know, you know in Hollywood the chance of you staying together for more than six months is like the odds it's 14 are... 14%. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you, put, you do this thing. It's really narcissism run rampant. I think both of them uh, should be scolded for this. And you know what, guys? Uh, do it the old-fashioned way, and then if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't, at least for this couple. Heather, last word. It will not be the last case we see like this, for sure. Yeah. Probably not. Can we get Sophia up one more time? <laughs> <laughs> because I, I want to make a, a quick point. Yeah, but she's cutting into my time. That's right. She is... 42 years old. Yes. I just looked it yeah. up. Yeah. She looks like a 24-year-old girl. Yep. I mean, it's a, just amazing. Isn't she dating the, the wolf now yes, from uh, the True Blood? Yes, they're, they're engaged. Really? Yeah. Wow. Which imagine. is another part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, no they can't adopt. i got to see what that couple produces. <laughs> right. That's true. You know, what a, what, a, what a joke. Wow. Let's stay a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> a little longer. Okay. Oh, there's another one. There's Ricky. Uh, let's oh, go. No, no, now, now, you have to say now, now you want me to follow that? Really? A woman to a beautiful man. So, Sophia Vergama, no. Uh, <laughs> look, most Americans today feel that the federal government has gotten a bit bloated. They're not very good at what they do anymore. And I got to admit that they're right. So what you see happening in, in our history in times like this, there is this kind of ebb and flow. And as we become more unhappy with the federal government, we start to see state government taking on more and more authority, more and more power. And that's been going on. But there's a problem. This, this makes a lot of people who are small government, state government uh, supporters, makes them happy. The problem is, is that those who are in state government are becoming so abusive of this power by trying to use it to force social agendas that they are going to ruin the opportunity that conservatives have to see it sh keep shifting in that direction. Today's case in point. The great state of Tennessee, the legislator has voted today to make the Bible the Bible, the official book of Tennessee. <laughs> now, they did this despite the fact that the state's attorney general made it very clear in opinion that not only did he believe that it was unconstitutional for the Bible to be a state book, mm -hmm. but that the money they would spend to get to that decision, because there will be litigation, was just wasting taxpayer money. Not a bad point. The governor popped up and said, this is so disrespectful to people who believe in the Bible. It's not a book. It's the word of God. And you're putting it right next to the state flower and this and that. Wow. This is what you see legislators doing. You guys want to see power shift to the states? You need to stop these people or stop electing these people who were making a mockery of it by forcing silly agendas. And shining a light on it like you just did is a good way to do that. Well, no well, question. By the way, we have the official book of the <laughs> Daily Wrap. That's right. It is we exposed. The Secret Life of Jody Arias. Anyway, by written Jane. by. Back written with more by. Daily Wrap in just a moment. And welcome back to the Daily Wrap. I'm your host, Joe Concha. If you're just joining us, we're in the middle of our potluck where we share our favorite stories of the day, and it's my turn. I'm going to talk about Harry Reid again and his just desserts. Rick brought it up before. So as we've seen, Mr. Reed has uh, an eye injury, actually had to go in for surgery. Uh, he says that he fell in the bathroom with his wife as his witness. No one's really doubting that. Uh, but Rush Limbaugh did a very, very shrewd thing on the radio about two days ago. And he said that I heard that Reed was actually beaten up by the mafia. <laughs> and mobsters actually beat the, beat the heck out of him and actually knocked his so eye basically out of its socket, right? And he just says, well, that's what I heard. So then let's put up the quote and the response from Harry Reid, who took the bait <coughs> perfectly. It shows the credibility of Rush Limbaugh. He's a guy that's got all this started. Why in the world would he come up with a story that I got heard in my own bathroom with my wife standing there? How could anyone say anything like that? I think a lot of people that I read kind of don't like me as a person. I think that's unfortunate. Remember that one line in there right there where he says, how could somebody say something about right. me like that? Right. Well, that's funny because I remember when this happened back in 2012. Let him prove that he has paid taxes, because he hasn't. No, I don't regret that at all. The Koch brothers 
no one would help me. They were afraid the Koch brothers would go after them. So I did it on my own. So no regrets about Mitt Romney, about the Koch brothers. Cause some people have even call, called it McCarthyite. Well, they call it whatever they want. Um, Romney didn't win, did he? So it's a means to an end. He basically made up something to muddy the waters to make Mitt Romney look like a tax cheat. And now basically is admitting, yeah, I made the whole thing up. And now can't believe that Rush Limbaugh would make up something about him and his eye injury. And then he is stupid enough, and I will say that, to take the bait and say, how can anybody say that I would, I would ever make up anything like that? Because you make up stuff as well, Mr. Reed. Mr. Ong? I, you know, I don't know if Harry Reid made up the story about, uh, about Mitt Romney or if, as he says, mm -hmm. somebody who would know gave him the information. It doesn't matter. What matters is it was wrong. Right. Now, you can be mistaken, but when you're mistaken, you yeah. stand up and you say, really sorry, I got information I thought was accurate. I was wrong. You don't say, he lost the election, didn't he? Who cares? Really, really foul. And you know what? It, 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 listen, if Rush Limbaugh says a year from now, uh, Harry Reid's out of office, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Harry Reid's going to have nothing to say oh, about no, it. Rush is basically saying, well, it's what I heard. In other words, he's admitting that he's, he's making doing it up. The same thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and, and the fact that Reid couldn't read into it, yeah. he just took right. the bait and actually had to respond. Yeah. It's amazing. Heather, quick thought. No, I just think that he is really, really make, showing himself to be a bad, bad thing Guy. going forward. Going forward, he's just going to look bad, and he's going to do a lot of bad things. Okay. Well, no, I'll tell you what makes him look bad is those sunglasses. I don't know what this like challenge. the sunglasses. Uh, the Blues Brothers or, uh, you know, who, who knows what... Who advised him to keep talking on camera when he's got this black eye? He looks like a villain from a bad James Bond movie. That's a very good point. He does kind of look like no, Dr. Evil. I like, it, I like it better with the full sunglasses on. Indeed. Yeah, the full sunglasses are it's definitely cool. a better look. So Harry Reid is bad. But what is good, by the way, and we want to show it once again. Oh. We're all holding him up oh, right now. Come on. The secret the life camera. of Jody Arias exposed. It it's, it's got trials and it's got lots of, you know, not stuff for the kids sort Nasty. of thing, but it is a New York Times bestseller. And it's written by Jane Velez <laughs> Mitchell. <laughs> Correct. Know. Let's give the author, by the way. By the way, that means you're up. Oh, well, you know, I went to NYU. So when I saw this on the front page of the New York Times today, it caught my eye. And I actually uh, heard about it uh, last spring when the story first broke. NYU. Uh, decided to build a campus in the United Arab Emirates, which is a bad idea to begin with because of their, uh, that country's horrible record on women and, uh, and a lot of other things. And it turns out that 10,000 workers were deprived of their basic labor rights uh, during the construction and many lived in miserable conditions and they had to pay fees to get the jobs and just one horror story after the other. Now, NYU has apologized and there was a big investigation, but still, I'm asking as somebody who graduated from NYU, why are you building in the United Arab Emirates? The, the Sharia law is practiced there and you know that means that people are flogged and they are flogged for kissing in public. They are stoned for premarital sex. I mean, why are we putting our resources, why is this university putting its resources in such a backward and discriminatory country? And I must say that uh, the United Arab Emirates has a reputation for misusing its workers. So they say they didn't know, but they should have been hyper vigilant. Can, can I make a, I'm just speculating here, but maybe they're doing it because they're getting some nice donations from the very yeah. rich yeah. Do you think? Do you think It's happening in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I, happen to know the attorney for the royal family there and I know the, the donations they make and what they do to bring American mm. enterprises over there That's so a shame. I don't really think NYU uh, an yeah. institution like that they're the violets right well I when I went there, we, we didn't have all that stuff. We just, it was a city campus. It I just thought the mascot campus. was a violence. I could be wrong on that then. Anyway, all the time we have for potluck. When we come back, it's our best part of the show, yay or nay. This is the Daily Wrap, only on Newsmax. <laughs> And welcome back to the Daily Wrap. It's time for yay or nay. First up, 
Apparently, North Korea was supplying nukes to Iran while world powers were in Switzerland trying to reach a nuclear agreement with the fine folks from Tehran earlier this month, which of course violates UN sanctions on both countries and stuff. To review, UN sanctions imposed on Iran back in 2010 prohibit the country from purchasing ballistic missile goods as well as, quote, technology related to ballistic missiles capable of delivering nuclear weapons. Since last September, two shipments of missile parts were sent from North Korea to Iran. However, UN officials say the transfers are covered by the sanctions. The next rounds of nuclear talks with Iran are scheduled to begin next week in Vienna. The goal is to reach a comprehensive agreement, you know, the kind of actual stuff that has details and everything in it this time, by the end of June. No matter what happens with these talks, panel, will Iran ever really stop trying to build nuclear weapons, Heather Hansen? No way. I mean, that's the problem. They're never going to stop. They don't even really pretend like they're going to stop. They, do, they want... They want us to believe that they're not going to stop because that's part of their culture and that's part of their, they need that ego thing. Defiance. Yeah, absolutely. And just, and just that they shouldn't have to stop. Right. Well, the question is trying to get a defined answer. You can't say no matter what happens because everything matters about what happens. If we reach a deal that's enforceable, hell yeah, that matters. If we don't, then of course they're going to keep building them. There's nothing to stop them. Chain. Well, I think they will keep trying to build nuclear weapons. And the question is, do we want them to build them underground in secret, or do we want to be able to see what they're doing so we can stop them? And that's why there's a deal to try to have transparency so we can observe what they're doing and stop them. I am a nay as well. They will never, ever stop trying to build nuclear weapons because that's just the way just they, who they are. are. Right, they exactly. They are, man. Well, they're not they willing are. to give up the centrifuges, right? Or So that well, alone get, but, tells me. But they apparently are going to give, apparently, are going to give up a lot of them from 19,000 to 6,000. That's pretty good. Okay, okay. only 6,000. What could possibly only go 6, <laughs> The internet <laughs> has been mostly critical of Hillary Clinton's new campaign logo, comparing it to hospital signs or asking if a third grader drew it and even saying it was funded by donations from the Saudis. So, we sent a reporter out. We didn't. ABC did. Their host, Jimmy Kimmel of Jimmy Kimmel Live, took to the streets of Los Angeles to see what people thought of some other possible campaign logos, logos excuse me, for Mrs. Clinton. We went out on the street today and asked people what... That's it. Please note there were some other logos, but they're not safe to air on this network. <laughs> Question, is a campaign logo really that important, Rick Unger? No. You wouldn't think so, but with the amount of press that it's gotten well, and the amount of... There's nothing else to talk right, about. The, yeah, you know. I, I agree with you. It's not, it's not that big of a deal. Think? I think Give Him Hill is actually, without the, <laughs> the devil face, actually a pretty good slogan. Maybe she should go for that. <laughs> I mean, she's accused of being stiff. If she gives him Hill, I think that might add a little bit of humor to the campaign. This, go for it, this Hill. This may catch on. I remember uh, President Obama's uh, campaign logo in 2008, and everybody thought he stole it from Pepsi. Because it was the same colors right. and yeah, 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 so it's it's hard to, for these things not to look like yeah. something. Anyway, London medical workers rushing to a life or death scene recently after receiving a call that a woman had collapsed. One problem, the woman in need was really a pigeon. Yes, called a case of a <laughs> classic misunderstanding. The bird is a slang term for woman right. in England. So when the Good Samaritan called for help, thinking the ambulance service was for animals as well, of course, and said a bird collapsed, he really meant a bird had collapsed. <laughs> the medical workers did try to save the bird, but unfortunately the bird so didn't make it. Funeral um, services will be held tomorrow. You people are laughing. <laughs> Should England find a different slang word for ladies? Let me ask you, Heather Hansen. I don't have any problem with bird. There's very few things that you can call me that would offend me. Bird's not one of them. You're a sweet broad. What do you think, Jane? <laughs> I have rescued pigeons off the streets of New York. I am actually moderating the Wild Bird Fund's flocktail next week at the Vanderbilt Museum. And, uh, 
mansion. Everybody's invited. I believe in rescuing birds, and I think we should continue to do that. Fascinating. Rick? There's always one every show. <laughs> uh, uh, come on. I don't care. I, mean, I, don't I know you do. We can't tell the press well, I like what to do. Anyway, birds. we got MSNBC weekend host Melissa Harris-Perry and her husband James owe the IRS about $70,000 in delinquent taxes. This according to a North Carolina newspaper. Oops. IRS has even placed a lien on the Perrys. Here's the bottom line. Quickly, everybody. Does anybody at MSNBC pay taxes? Jane. <laughs> I'm sure they do. This Heather, I think the majority. Does. I know they do. I have friends there. Okay, very good. And that's all of our time. Thank you, panel. I'm Joe Concha saying, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Oh. Yeah.